Tech Talks, um, what's up? My name's John Overhide, um, co-founder and CTO at Duo. This is our lovely office in Ann Arbor. Um, we host these Duo Tech Talks primarily in Ann Arbor here, probably 90% of them, but we've also been expanding them to um, uh, the Bay Area, um, Austin, and we have our first London-based Duo Tech Talk uh, coming up. So. Time zone wise, you can probably still watch it. Um, if you fly out there to watch it, then, you know, in person, then you get extra Duo Tech Talk points. <laughs> Redeemable for, I don't know, Bitcoin or something. Um, <clears throat> but actually, the next Duo Tech Talk in, in London will be really interesting. It's on video game hacking and reverse engineering. So it uh, should be a pretty interesting talk. Um, you know, the goal of Duo Tech Talks is to bring together technical community. Um, we often focus. Uh, some of these talks on, on security, um, but you know we like a, a broad diversity of, of talks. Last time we had a talk on Azure machine learning, which is really interesting. So if you wanna go back and view any of the, the videos from past talks, they should, um, I think, almost all be on our, our YouTube channel, maybe with the exception of Tom Tachek, who, uh, who came here a few months ago. Love you, Tom. Um, he'll, he'll let us post that someday, I, I don't know. Um, before we get started uh, with today's talk, uh, any any announcements from some from folks in the community? Any events coming up? Other conferences, user groups? Um, do we have the catch box? Is that working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. Oh, you can use the mic. Um, so the Information Assurance Student Association is always looking for speakers um, to come and speak uh, to Eastern students to uh, teach us something new. So if you'd like to help out with that and volunteer in the community, you can come talk to me. I'm Jessica Wilson, um, and we'd appreciate it. Um, some of you might find it interesting that the crypto party uh, Ann Arbor is having a Tor Hack Day this Sunday. Uh, so if you're here, you might find that interesting. It's in all hands active at 1 p.m. going until uh, people get sick of it. What is the crypto party? Is it like a, a key exchange party or key signing party? Or? Yeah, we'll do key signing. We do basic security hygiene education, uh, everything from password managers to GPG to Tor. Cool. Anybody else? Um, I can pull up my calendar here. I think there's some events coming up if I can figure this out. Oh, let's see. October. Um, October 17th is the North American International Cyber Summit uh, held in Kobo. So similar to the auto show, but the cyber show. Uh, down in Detroit. So that's held by the state of Michigan, um, hosted by the governor's office. Um, check it out down there. I don't know the address, but if you search for NAI Cyber on Google, you'll probably find it. Um, and on the 19th, there is a uh, event in Detroit at the Hopcat Bar called uh, uh, Build, Build IT, um, Build IT Together. and. Uh, Kind of a small event, but um, at the Hopcat, which is cool. You can check that out. And then on the 20th is Summit, which is the um, uh, annual uh, security conference here in, um, in Ann Arbor, hosted by the University of Michigan. I think it's going to be at Rackham again. Um, some great, um, great speakers and great uh, panelists. Um, and following Summit is actually our next Duo Tech Talk. Uh, so that same, same day. In the evening, um, Aaron Atwater will be coming to town talking about um, Threshold Crypto, if you're interested in that, which is very cool stuff. Um, anything else I missed? Gurkhan, when is Gurkhan? Uh, next week, Thursday, Friday. Oh, geez. Okay, Gurkhan is next week, Thursday and Friday in Grand Rapids. Craziness. And ARPSEC, uh, first Wednesday of every month. Um, so that's like next week, too. Uh, <laughs> And uh, A2Y.ASM just happened. Um, it's a cool event uh, organized by, by Zach, uh, Mark, and, and Chris. And that happened at uh, Bonacera in Ypsilanti. So I think they have videos they're gonna post online from that. So lots of, lots of cool stuff happening in the area if you're interested in, in security. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Job announcements? Anyone hiring? Duo. Duo's hiring? What are we hiring for, Lisa? Duo.com slash jobs. Anybody else? 
Just Duo. Just, just come work at Duo. <laughs> It'll be cool, I promise. All right, so um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have our, our speaker here today. Um, uh, Susan just flew in uh, yeah, from uh, uh, the, the, the West Coast. Um, Susan is a, a professor of cybersecurity policy at uh, Worcester Polytechnic. Um, she's got a long resume, uh, and uh, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but one interesting tidbit that I hope Susan can talk about is she did testify uh, in front of Congress, was it last year? This past March. This past March around the, um, a lot of the Apple and FBI uh, encryption debate. So, um, uh, very steeped in uh, cybersecurity policy, and we're really excited to have her here today. So give her a warm welcome. Thank you. So I, I have to say it's amazing to see all of you here because yesterday I was at a, a workshop that the Marconi Foundation did. Marconi Foundation honored Marty Hellman and Whit Diffie. Whit Diffie and I wrote a book together uh, uh, 15 years ago. They honored Marty Hellman and Whit Diffie for their development of Public Key. Uh, some number of years ago, and after Marty and, and Witt won the Turing Award, they decided to have a workshop yesterday, and then a dinner, and I came and I spoke. A lot of people came and spoke, and, well, not that many, but the people who came included Rivest, included uh, Ralph Merkel, who also developed Public Key, not, not the, the key exchange, that is not the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, not the idea of digital signatures, but he had simultaneously come up with that, and, and, uh, and uh, he was there as well. And one of the things that, that Ralph actually talked about was when he first came up with this idea and presented it in the class uh, as a, one of the class projects, it got thrown out uh, as, as just stupid and not workable. Um, and then uh, he showed it to somebody at Berkeley who thought it was good work. And he wrote it up for the communications of the ACM and he submitted it and it was reviewed by, and he said yesterday he was told it was reviewed by a top, top person and it came back, the review came back saying, there aren't any references, there's no work like this previously. If this idea were any good, then, then, then it would have been talked about previously and it got rejected. It took Ralph three years to get his papers published. Marty and, and Witt were faster. But the point of my telling you this as I look out on you is, there were the three of them working on this in the mid-70s. And there were just the three of them. And then Rivest and Shamir and Edelman. And it was really quite amazing to us as we were there talking about the, the beginnings and the NSA pushback against them, because the pushback then was about publication as opposed to deployment. Um, but it was amazing to hear just these, these little saplings or these little pieces of grass pushing up through the concrete, and then to come here. And I have to say, you know, having, I live on the East Coast. I was out on the West Coast. Michigan is the hinterlands, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so I come out here, and my God, on a Thursday evening, this is how packed this is. Wow. So anyway, what I, what I do for a living for the last 20 years is I work on crypto and cybersecurity policy. I'm originally a, a techie. I, I originally used to do fast algorithms for, for algebraic problems, including things related to crypto. Um, but uh, around the time that Witt and I wrote our book, I sort of moved into cybersecurity policy. First it was crypto policy, and then cybersecurity policy. And so I'm going to talk probably a little differently from most of the talks you've heard, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about the law and how the pieces fit together. Um, and so let me preface this with something I told my, my husband's a theoretician. He proves theorems for a living. And one day he came home and I, uh, I said to him, I finally figured out Washington. And he said, yes. Uh, remember, he proves theorems for a living. And I said, facts are 10% of the equation. And he looked at me like I'd gone off the deep end. <laughs> And I said, yeah, facts are 10% of the equation. Well, I've never gotten any further with him, but when I talk to people in DC, they get it right away. Yeah, facts are 10% of the equation. So I think it's really important uh, for the half of the community that I'm part of, that is that my cyber part of it, my community, that is, I'm, I still think of myself as a techie, and occasionally I still write techie papers. Um, I think it's really important for us techies to understand the policy pieces, the law pieces. You don't have to write papers in it. You don't have to do research in it. But understanding how it meshes with what you do is really crucial, because uh, it really impacts you. And it doesn't matter if the technology can't do x. If the law says it must do x, and you get thrown into jail for not doing x, you have to do x. So with that in mind, um, this is work that I did with uh, Steve Bellavin, um, Matt Blaze and Sandy Clark a few years ago. I'm going to tell you the work, why we did it, and then how things have changed since we did it. 
But first, I'm going to start with some law. Um, so Title III, the first wiretap law, wiretap law can take a whole semester in law school. You're going to hear it in three or four slides. Um, the first law that we had, first federal law we had, essentially the first, there was one early, but that's not particularly important. The first federal law we had was Title III of the Omnibus uh, Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, and it set up a warrant procedure for wiretapping. Wiretapping is a particularly invasive search in most searches in the United States. The law enforcement comes to your door and shows you a search warrant. That doesn't happen with a wiretap because of course they would never then get any evidence. Instead, you find out in the case of criminal investigations 90 days after the wiretap. In the case of foreign intelligence surveillance uh, investigations, you only, f you only find out if the evidence is used in court, which it very rarely is. Um, Title III says that um, wiretaps can only be used when it's a serious crime from a list. It was originally 25, it's now just under 100. Uh, list of serious crimes, uh, the communication device has to be used in the planning of the crime, crime. It has to be essentially last resort. Not exactly last resort, but pretty close to it. You can't go and get a wiretap at the beginning of an investigation, um, except in very rare circumstances, a kidnapping investigation, if you have reason to know who's, who's doing the kidnapping and so on. But, but generally, it's, it's, it's late, it occurs late in the investigation. Preparing the application is actually complicated. Um, and then there are other laws that impact wiretapping. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, the other thing that I have to fill in for you in the, my five minutes of wiretap law is the way the United States views um, content versus uh, metadata. And I know it's an English phone booth. Um, we had a case in 1967, that's what precipitated Title III, that said, um, even in so public a place as a phone booth, and our phone booths used to look like that, they really were glass, not, not, not with all the red and, and doodads, but, but glass. Even in so public a place as a public phone booth, a person has an expectation of privacy. And the government, if they're going to do a search, which is what a wiretap is, they need to get a, a warrant. And so there was no warrant procedure, which is how we got Title III. Uh, 12 years later, um, there was a robbery in Baltimore and shortly after the woman was robbed, she kept getting these phone calls. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you again. I'm going to come again, which were pretty freaky to her. The other thing she noticed was that there was a car that was frequently driving past her apartment house. Uh, same car. So she took down the license plate, called the police with the license plate, looked up who the license plate belonged to. They did a reverse lookup to find out the person's phone number and then put a pen register on the phone that records every num all the outgoing calls. The number that they found was, um, was the, the, what they did then is with that, they, uh, uh, and, and, and that was the person who had been called, uh, sorry, the, when they put the pen register on that phone number, they found he was the person calling the woman who'd been robbed. At that point, they had enough pro uh, evidence for probable cause. They got a search warrant, went into his house, and found that he had stuff from her apartment, and also from other people. Um, he fought the case and said they shouldn't have been able to get the phone numbers he was dialing um, without a warrant. And we have a principle in uh, US law that when you share information with a third party, if I pay cash to you, that's a transaction between us. But if I write you a check, the bank knows about the check. And so the fact that I'm sharing that information with the bank means that there's less protection to the information. The government can get it under a subpoena, which needs a lower level of proof. Same thing was true about the, the dial digits. And the dial digits, because they were shared with the phone company, ignore the fact that you can't make a phone call without dialing the digits, the dial digits we're subject to less protection. And so we've had for 40 years a split between content and non-content. Or really, this is not actually non-content. This is dialing, routing, addressing, and um, signaling information. Um, those are terms that make sense for the phone company. They make less sense uh, for IP communications, but that's a different paper. Um, so there was a time that wiretapping was easy. Um, this is the phone that I and one or two people in the audience grew up with. Um, I actually have one on my desk at home. Uh, I have two phones with two different lines. Uh, this one weighs three pounds. It's made out of Bakelite. It has a real bell in it. Um, and 
when the credit card company that calls to see uh, to check the, whether or not you've made a uh, you've ordered something from Lithuania you don't pick up that phone because you can't press one in order to say yes I authorized it and then it takes you a half hour to call back the credit card company phones stayed fixed then phones began to move and then voice communications got more complicated um, so back in the 1980s when most of you were kids or not kids most of you weren't around yet Back in the 1980s, the phone company got split up. Um, as it got split up, there, were com there was competition to uh, the long distance carrier. And the competition consisted of something, I and mean, this is something that most of you have never experienced. You dialed a phone number 800, you know, the toll free, and then some phone number. That wasn't the place you were trying to call. The place you were trying to call was you then maybe had to put in your account number, and then you dialed the number you were calling. You guys with me? So there you are doing dialing on what sounds like content, right? Because you've made the connection to the phone company that's your carrier for cheap long distance. You know, this is a form of VoIP or whatever before there was VoIP. You guys with me on what I'm talking about? About how the good. That's content, but you could do the same. Uh, uh, but uh, that sorry, that's signaling information, dialing information. But you could also do the same thing. You could call the bank and then tell them to do something with your bank account. That's clearly content. So it got complicated for law enforcement and for law about what, what counts as content, how do we do it? Um, and of course, as I've just pointed out, the number you dialed might not be the number of interest because the number of interest might be the, the numbers after the first set of digits. What happens after you make a call? Well, you guys are all IP guys, so you don't think about telephony, with one exception, I think, in the room. Um, in the 1970s, the phone company redesigned their system so that there are two, two planes as you do a phone call. One is the call data plane that sets up the call and establishes the call. That's communication from the phone company switches all along. I'm just going to do it with my hands because I didn't draw the picture. And then the content is on the call content channel. But I'm lying a little because at the moment that you hang up the phone, there's a signal that goes from the call content channel back to the call data channel. The reason this is important is because later on I'm going to talk to you about security of wiretapping. The more you mix up the call content channel, which is what you want to tap, with the call data channel, the more chances you have for messing up the call data channel and letting somebody else wiretap instead. Okay. And what, what this gave you was a separation of roles, which is simply good security. Um, in the 1990s, the FBI saw, foresaw wiretapping complications. Now, I don't know if you're going to giggle at this one, but 20 years ago, um, the FBI director complained about call forwarding, making it hard to wiretap. The reason it was hard to wiretap is the way wiretapping had been done between the 60s and the 90s was the phone numbers, and think wires for a moment, Think, you know, the old phone coming in on a wire into the phone central office. You guys still with me on the technology? Good. The phones come in in order. So the lines come in in order. So 6035, 6036, 6037, 6038. You want to tap 6038, you put the tap on right on the line going between the phone company and the subscriber. Okay? Well, that's fine until you have what you call advanced phone switching technology like call forwarding. Then the call doesn't go down to 6036. It stops at the frame, that, that piece of wood, or what used to be a piece of wood, with the phone lines coming in, and it gets turned around at the switch. And so the FBI director testified to Congress that they were having tremendous trouble. Um, and so they, um, they also ran into trouble. This is my good friend, Whit Diffie. Or they thought they were running into trouble about encryption. I have briefing in 1992 where they said either 60 or 40 I can't remember uh, I can look it up uh, either but let's say 40 let's say 60 percent of all calls would be encrypted by 1994 I'm still waiting um, and then there were more challenges which is say cell phones so when you're not roaming it's really easy for law enforcement to tap you that is under court order whenever I say easy I mean technically easy I don't mean without court order. I, I tend to talk too quickly and I forget to say that, but I mean with court order. If you're not roaming, the court order is at your cell phone provider 
and you're within your cell phone's district, so anytime a call comes in, your call provider says, tap this call. If you're roaming outside your district, what happens is um, any call coming into you still gets tapped easily because it comes into your home location register. That says wiretap order on this person, and then that goes out with the call to wherever you're roaming. You guys with me? In the visitor location register. However, the first time when you're, what happens when you make calls out? The first time you make a call out, um, do I have this? Ah, no, so the first time somebody calls you, that works. The next time that someone calls you, the, you have already been routed through the phone company to your visitor location register. I can never remember which way this works. I think this is the right way. You, um, and so the call comes directly to you. It doesn't go through your home location register. You don't get tapped. When you make out, no, I've got it wrong. It still goes through your home location register. It's the outgoing calls you make. You make an outgoing call from your phone. First time you do it, the visitor location register checks with your home to see whether or not your phone is paid up. Your phone's paid up and it says also tap this, not, this guy. And so that call gets tapped. After that, the phone company knows you've, been, you've paid for your calls. You don't, get, you don't get tapped after that on the outgoing calls. Or if you do get tapped, it's because it has to go through your home location register. That slows the call down. If you're a smart guy who's paying attention to how you're working, you say, this is really weird. I think I'm being tapped. Okay. Examples of those kinds of things you might pick up, any of you who've seen The Wire know that at one point in The Wire, there's an interesting thing that happens to somebody's phone. I'm being tapped. Um, most criminals don't do interesting things. Um, that is to say, the large majority of criminals are stupid and, and they get picked up by law enforcement from having done stupid things. Um, the FBI solution to these challenges, not encryption, but te technologies they couldn't tap simply, and, and, and uh, uh, cell phones, uh, was the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA. It's a 1994 law that does not apply to information services. Information services in 1994 speak is, is the internet, okay? Um, except it talked about if there are substantial for the phone, then maybe it would apply. But the way the law is written, if you go and read the law, is it says A and B, not not C, mathematician and a good lawyer can say it doesn't apply to the internet. However, but let me get to that however in a minute. Kalia says that any digitally switched network has to be built wiretap enabled. What that means is the wiretap capability has to be built into the switch. You're supposed to gasp now. Um, so they're supposed to have a required standard interface. It took decade to fight, out, fight about the interface. The switch handled the details of the, um, of the wire tapping. It created, remember I said to you, when you hang up a call, it creates confusion between the call content layer and the call data plane, call data um, uh, channel. This creates further confusion because now you have stuff in the call uh, data channel that says, tap this line. And there's more communication between these two. Any more, anytime you increase the communication between the call content channel and the call data channel, you let yourself in for potential security breaches. Um, under FBI influence, such solutions became required in other parts of the world. What I mean by that is the FBI began briefing police in other parts of the world about the problems they were seeing and suggestions for how they too might pass laws like CALEA. Um, wiretapping capabilities into communications infrastructure creates risk. Why? Because now, you think about it, you want to tap me, you have to tap my line. You want to tap Lockheed Martin, you tap at Lockheed Martin. You want to get a lot of stuff, tap at a switch. Okay, at a switch you get a lot more than you get at Lockheed Martin or at my phone line. You've got a rich target, which is a central point of failure. So is this all theoretical? Well, no. So how many of you know about Vodafone Greece? Not everybody, so I will talk about Vodafone Greece briefly. Um, Vodafone Greece. Uh, Vodafone Greece uh, bought a switch from Ericsson. Um, a, a Swedish, uh, Swedish? Swedish? Swedish supplier. Um, Vodafone Greece didn't want wiretapping capability, so they didn't pay for it, and they didn't have wiretapping capability. Switch got updated. Um, wiretapping capability was introduced. 
But um, Vodafone Greece hadn't paid for the wiretapping capability, so it wasn't turned on. And there was no auditing. Whenever you do wiretapping, you also have auditing to make sure that whoever's wiretapping is tracked properly. Vodafone Greece hadn't paid for the wiretapping capability. The wiretapping capability was shut off, and there was no auditing capability. And then, and then somebody went into the switch, whether physically in the room or remotely, we don't know, and turned on the wiretapping capability. And for a period of 10 months between 2004 and 2005, 100 senior members of the Greek government were wiretapped. Um, and this includes the prime minister, the head of the Ministry of Defense, the head of the opposition party. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, the messages were sent to 16 cell phones in the Athens area. At one point, an SMS went awry, didn't go where it was supposed to be. Greek, uh, Vodafone Greece started to investigate, found the wiretapping, everything disappeared. So I've now told you technically what was done. If you, if you want to read it, there's a great article in IEEE Spectrum called The Athens Affair that describes the technical pieces beautifully. Um, Bamford has an article in which he claims that uh, the NSA did it, and he describes how the NSA did it, which is that the NSA was invited in to do certain things in, in Greece because of the, um, the Olympics, and then they stayed without the Greek government being aware of it. Um, I would say that, that Bamford's arguments are somewhat plausible there, but Bamford doesn't have what I would say the same kind of proof that you see in the Snowden documents. Um, but what happened there is that wiretapping capability was built into the switch, and then it got abused. Now, uh, I and my friends, that is the people who work at this inter funny intersection of security and policy, often use the Greek Vodafone case, and sometimes people in Washington say, enough with that case. It is the shining example. There are other examples. Um, there are other examples that the US government knows about but doesn't talk about. Um, and I can't tell you about them because they don't talk about them. Telecom Italia, 60, 000, for a period of uh, 10 years, 60,000 people in Italy were wiretapped without court order. Um, 60,000 or 600,000? Uh, it's one in 10,000 Italians were wiretapped. It included judges, sports figures, referees, actors, actresses, um, business people. What's the purpose? Blackmail. Now, all of us have stuff that we'd rather not other people know about, whether it's a medical condition, a medical condition of a, of a sibling or a spouse or a, a child or some behavior that we're just a little bit embarrassed about. It's very easy to blackmail. This case has been going on as often happens in Italy for a long time. Um, a few years ago when I was writing a book, I talked to somebody at NSA, um, the technical director for information assurance at NSA, and he, uh, when the US government, when the Department of Defense uses equipment, uses communications equipment, uh, NSA checks it out to make sure it, 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 it works. It works properly. There aren't security risks. And what he told me, this is in the 2005 time frame, so 11 years after CALEA was passed, all CALEA compliance switches that the NSA tested had security flaws in the CALEA compliant aspect of the switch. So I said, so the others were OK? He said, I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. Now we assume that all of those, those problems got fixed because the NSA found it. But what about the switches that didn't get tested? Um, what happens in 2003 is that VoIP is becoming a substantial replacement for the phone network. So a little aside is that there were the crypto wars, and, and I'll take a few minutes at the end to talk about the House Judiciary hearings, because I think it's of interest and not unrelated. But there were the crypto wars between the 70s, 80s, and 90s about first publication of cryptography, then who sets the standards for cryptography, then um, whether or not cryptography can be included in equipment sent for export. In 2000, the US loosened its controls on export of computer and communications devices with strong cryptography. Strong cryptography is a funny term. It means cryptography that's hard to break now. So, you know, wait 10 years and that, you know, is a diff that, number, that strong is a, a different thing. But um, in 2000, the US government changed its stance and it allowed the export unless the equipment was going to governments, 
communications providers or was custom built. And if you think about that and the NSA's mission, it doesn't care so much about SSL. It cares about the uh, communications equipment that a government is using. It cares about the communications equipment that a provider has because that protects everybody and it cares about custom built stuff because that's gonna be more difficult to get into. So what the NSA had done was a very astute partitioning of the space. Silicon Valley had been very upset about the export controls and by, by splitting in that way, Silicon Valley got what it wanted, the heat on the US government to loosen export controls lessened a great deal, and, um, and the NSA still had access to looking at and doing on a case-by-case -case basis things going to governments, communications providers, and custom built. But what you had in 2000 was this split. In the, two th in the 1990s, the NSA and FBI were somewhat aligned. FBI didn't want to see strong crypto deployed domestically. NSA didn't want to see it deployed internationally. With the change in controls, Although the controls were about export, it affected domestic product because if you can't export strong crypto, you don't say to the French, you get 40 bit, we're using 128. It just doesn't fly, not for the French, the Germans, the Swedes, anybody. And so the, the effect was that companies were using weak crypto domestically as well as abroad. With the change in export controls, NSA had obviously bought into it or it wouldn't have happened. Uh, the FBI was not happy. So just hold on to that thought too. 2003, VoIP is becoming a substantial replacement for the phone network. Now, the VoIP that was becoming a substantial replacement is not the VoIP that you guys have on your phones, if you have it on your phones. It's the VoIP that was between providers. So people still had you know, cell phones, but they also had fixed lines from their, stat, you know, the, the black telephone. There were a lot more black telephones. They were pink and orange and so on. But there were a lot more phones of that sort back in 2003. There was still a line from that phone to the phone company and presumably a line on the other end. But in the middle, there was VoIP, okay? And, and the FBI was saying, VoIP is becoming a substantial replacement. We need change. Um, and sought to uh, extend Kalia to VoIP. Um, now, if you read the law, as I told you, it says no. Uh, at the time I was working at Sun, a whole bunch of tech companies and civil liberties organizations fought this. Um, <coughs> and um, it was first, uh, first the Federal Communications Commission had to make a decision. They said, well, yeah, FBI's right. So the case went to the appeals court uh, in Washington and the appeals court in a two to one decision voted to, in favor of the FBI. And they voted in, the, in favor of the FBI for what's called facilities-based VoIP. Facilities-based VoIP is exactly the case of VoIP I just described to you. In terms of technically wiretapping, it's not hard. You're still putting the wiretap on at the phone central office. So it doesn't mess up the technology in the way that if you're using real VoIP on your phone would. You know, I'm, I'm not defining any technical terms. I'm defining legal terms, but I figure for this crowd, you can ask, and I do not mind in being interrupted. I should have said that earlier. Court of Appeals extended Kalia to facilities-based VoIP. I was talking to someone in the FCC maybe four or five years ago. He said, we were astounded. We didn't really expect the decision to go that way. What's more is although it extended it to facilities-based VoIP, that's because that's what the FBI asked for. In terms of legal process, it said that it extends to VoIP, which is pretty shocking. Because if you think about how the FBI wiretaps and it wants switches, yeah. Um, no, it, it said digitally switched, it, 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 the law was written for telephony and um, uh, IP is not considered a, um, I, I'm going to not do the telephony law right, it's, uh, so let me say something that's not exactly right, but it's an information service which is not the same thing as what, whatever the, you know, if there's a lawyer in the room who does telephony, they'll be able to say the right terms for telephony, but it was a matter of how the law was phrased. It's a funny thing, I, I come at all this as a mathematician, and the best analogy I can give you 
is if we say all primes are even and then somebody says, what about two? We change the theorem slightly and we say, except for two, all primes are even. We've got the right theorem. In law, if you say all primes are even and, and somebody brings up two, the, the law is completely wrong. It's thrown out. It, it, they, they go precisely with how the law is written. It's, it's a different kind of way of thinking than, than I, uh, certainly the mathematicians and, and I suspect engineers, but, but I'm trained as a mathematician you originally. Talk extensively to keep data communications, packet, um, uh, packet switch networks separate from circuit switch. This was a substantial fight throughout the, the, the late 90s, and we won. Until later than we lost. <laughs> right, right. We won for a while. Uh, we won for a while. Um, so then we get to this, and I just want to talk about these very briefly in terms of architecture. This one doesn't move. This one moves. This one, the data is all at Facebook. I got reminded last night about Google. It's encrypted at Google. It's not in the clear at Google, but of course Google can get to it in the clear. Uh, I I've not worked at Facebook, so I can't make that claim, but presumably, given everything that Facebook does, they can also get to it in the clear. The original Skype was peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, Skype now is not peer-to-peer, -peer, so this is the original Skype. And for law, law enforcement, these were all problems. Not this one. This one they knew how to deal with, and this one they were learning how to deal with. This one was a problem because the law applies to telephony, it doesn't apply to information services. So it's exactly what you're saying. You know, we fought successfully for a while, but then with the facilities-based VoIP, we lost part of that battle. This is a different kind of service. It's not telephony, but it's not required by the law. It's not required by CALEA to build interfaces. So they weren't talking there about a technical problem. They were talking about a process problem. It took them longer, it took them more effort, and so on, to be able to do the kind of wiretapping. And this, with the old Skype, of course, if it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's actually essentially impossible. The new Skype, that is, Skype has evolved in the time that, uh, in the last eight years, and I would not say it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so if you think about it sort of from a structural point of view, you start to realize the really big differences between IP and, um, and, and telephony. And we all know about it in terms of the, you know, how it's actually architected and packet switched versus circuit switched, but I'm thinking it, of it more, more abstractly than that. Um, so for example, in telephony, the service providers provide the facility. The company you deal with, AT&T, gives you the service. And it, it gives you everything. You are with a, it's, it's hard to talk about now because everything is so separate. But 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you were at a company that had a PBX, so at the, at the desk downstairs, there was somebody who routed calls, the company that, that PBX service was provided by AT&T along with all the other phone service. Now what we've got is we've got dumb wires. AT&T or Verizon might give you your cell service, but it doesn't give you any of the, the, the functions you do on your phone. They're completely separate. How do you tap? Tapping at the AT&T office doesn't do anything when your service is a Google service or a Skype service or a, or a, a Facebook service or a Snapchat service because it's, the data is never visible. Um, there are also, of course, new services all the time. If you go back between the 1930s and the 1960s, the, the process of innovation was very slow. Between the 60s and the 80s, it was pretty slow. It was faster than it had been the previous 30 years, but not fast. Between the, seven, between the 80s and uh, mid-1990s, faster than before. Now, you know, probably when I go to my room, there's going to be yet another service, which, like Yo, might catch a million people in a few weeks, or uh, let them alone Pokemon Go. Uh, um, <coughs> people switch communication uh, modalities within a session. There's peer-to-peer -peer communications and their encryptions. And there's encryption. So the FBI in September 2010 said it was going dark. And they announced this. They had a program inside the FBI where they'd been talking about it for a while, but now they announced it um, publicly. They talked to a New York Times reporter. And their solution was that internet services and apps should be tappable, designed tappable. Um, you guys know that the internet 
encourages lightweight solutions built quickly and consequently hard to secure. You know, the, the model of the two people, three people in a garage, and one of them should be a lawyer, doesn't fly. Um, but services like that are also not only hard to secure, they're easy to exploit. So as Blaze, Bellavin, Clark, and I began thinking about this, we said, look, you know, Kalia applied to the PSTN, as I've shown you already, is risky. Kalia applied to IP networks is even more so, because we know IP networks are so much harder to secure. And I'm, I'm not doing that talk, but I assume you all know it, or you wouldn't be at Duo, visiting Duo or working at Duo. Um, so we said, wait a minute. Either the developer puts the capability in in response to each request, if you're going to build wiretapping in. So here's the, you know, suppose you, you follow the FBI model for a second. Either the developer puts capability into wiretap, and every time somebody wants to wiretap, they come to the developer and says, let me in. How well does that fly? How well does that scale? Not so well, right? Or the developer re enables remote access to devices by other parties. How secure is that? Yeah. Um, and it won't work because there's crypto, there's open source, there's offshoring. The model doesn't make sense. So the FBI proposed this in 2010. I spoke at a hearing in 2011. And at the hearing was the general counsel of the FBI. And one of the congressmen said, you're at this hearing. What's your bill? What are you proposing? And she said, we don't have a bill, sir. And he said, why are you here? And she said, you invited us. Um, but the point was that every time the FBI came up with a potential solution, a so potential, will only require it of companies that serve more than 10,000 customers. If you have fewer than 10,000 customers, you don't have to build wiretapping in. And then you have to re-architect when you hit 10,000. Every time they made a proposal, it didn't get very far because the government shot it down. Not, not the private sector, but in fact the government. Um, but there's an alternative solution, and that's the vulnerability solution. And that's using vulnerabilities on a device to wiretap. It's a solution that the FBI has to go after anyway, because the really good criminals, I shouldn't call them good criminals, the really sophisticated criminals, the Zetas, and the Zetas are sort of the poster child of sophisticated criminals. The Zetas are the, the drug dealers in, in Mexico, the really violent, horrible drug dealers in Mexico. They roll their own. Now, most people, when they roll their own, don't do it very well. These guys do it very well. Okay, and if, if law enforcement is going to get into the really sophisticated systems, they're going to have to, to use vulnerabilities to get in. Um, and the solution, of course, of using vulnerabilities is that it does, the, the beauty of it is that it doesn't increase risk. Um, so how do you do it? First thing you do if you're law enforcement is you get a warrant. I want to tap your phone. I get a warrant. And then I search your phone by, by pinging it, doing things to it. And I find out what OS you have on it. What version of the OS? That doesn't make sense if it's an Apple phone, but it makes a lot of sense if it's an Android. Um, and I see what apps you have and what versions you have. Then I get another warrant. And I go back in and I download a wiretap app to your phone. Maybe by sending you a piece of email, maybe by making some particularly attractive page that I know you're going to go to, maybe by putting a stingray that is a, um, a man in the middle attack so it looks to you like you're going to where you think you're going but you're not, and you go to a, a web page that has a vulnerability in that, and I have it tailored to your device. And I download the wiretap, I am the FBI, I download the wiretap on your phone. Yes? That's right, that's right. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science that this can be done. The only difference is it's tailored to your device. And that's an important difference, I'll get to you in a second, because you don't want the vulnerability to get out and start working on other people's, okay? One thing I wanted to ask you about the previous slide when you talked about um, that this doesn't increase risk. Mm -hmm. um, I, assume the mention, I assume the meaning behind that is that it doesn't increase risk because the vulnerability is it's already there. Uh, so when you talk about it doesn't increase risk, I assume the meaning there is that, well, the vulnerability is there, whether we find it or somebody else, it's not, we're not introducing the vulnerability. But one of the things... Stop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
you can you get to ask that question in about ten minutes if I haven't an answered okay. it. Okay, uh, perfect. Um, what did I just say? I just suggested that the U.S. government put vulnerabilities on your device, this device, your phone, and so on, under search warrant, and they in fact. In order to probe, they have to get a warrant. So it's a two-warrant process. Oh, just a quick question. On the vulnerabilities the, that's being tailored to your device, is it tailored via specific device, like an, your EIN, or is it just tailored because you have, you know, uh, Skype version 1.0? 1 .1? No, no, no. It wants to be tailored to it's your so device. It's kind of unique yeah. identifier right. it's, it's right. using. Okay. One more question. Uh, I forget how many years ago, a pres uh, presentation from Matt Blaze at a workshop uh, is talking about wiretapping, that at, at least at that time, um, the wiretap thus was not just a particular device, but a particular person. So they had to listen. So the, 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 the way around it was like you'd have your daughter answer your phone. Right. So he's talking about minimization, which is different. Um, we are now, uh, minimization was real. So the law says when you're wiretapping, you have to make sure that you're tapping the person who's the subject of the warrant. So what you're talking about is you call, you know, you're tapping a regular wireline phone in a home. Uh, you want to make sure it's the person, and in fact, you want to make sure they're talking about the criminal activity. If they're talking about going out for milk, unless you think that's code, you're not allowed to listen. You have to shut it off, right. and that's what makes wiretapping expensive. It's changed somewhat about the making sure it's tagged to the individual. The law hasn't changed, but the way we use devices has. And something like 97 or 99 percent of the Title III wiretaps are um, cell phones or mobile phones. And those are almost always belonging to an, a particular individual and they don't get swapped out. The law still applies, but, but it's less of an issue for that reason. Um, so how do you do this? Um, you download the app. The wiretap using a vulnerability tailored to the OS, the apps on the device. Once the wiretap app is on the target, it can begin working. If the user of the phone updates her phone, so her phone can no longer has no longer has that vulnerability, doesn't matter because the app is already there working, and the what what was the vulnerability was needed to to get in to download it. Once it's on, it they're tapped. Um, <coughs> can it really work? Well, you need a stable of working vulnerabilities, a careful policy to protect targets and the public, and you also need a way for state and local police to, to use these tools. So it is the case now that more than 50% of Title III wiretaps are done by state and local police under state and local laws that are le at least as restrictive as the federal wiretapping law. That's a requirement of the federal wiretapping law. How does the vulnerability get off the phone if it's been patched and it's already downloaded and most likely hidden? No, the vulnerability, I mean, how does the wiretap get the, off the, the phone? The download. How does the download get off oh, the so, phone? Oh, you know, so you've tapped. got a, an operating, I mean, Apple had a vulnerability. Apple had three vulnerabilities on its phone recently that was discovered by a human rights worker in Bahrain. And Apple produced patches. And then you did updates. Yeah. Now your phone was no longer vulnerable to those particular attacks. Right, but the, the download, so your, your actual tap that's sitting on the is phone. It's sitting on the phone. If your host. Forever. Your, that's right. That's right. That's what I was getting at. Right, right. I mean, you can start fresh and get rid of everything. And, and if you're a human rights worker in Bahrain, I suspect. In fact, I have been reviewing papers on that, and they're not doing as good OPSEC as they ought to. Um, so, <coughs> law enforcement has to discover or purchase a vulnerability, zero day, day exploits. You all, you guys all know what zero days are, yes? Oh. And will there be enough vulnerabilities? This is where we were in 2013, and the answer is yes. Um, and, um, you know, you know all the places to get them. These were the numbers in 20. 13 and 20, in 2012, as we were writing the paper, I don't have to tell you how the numbers have increased and how the world has changed since then. Um, but what I want to talk to you about, and this gets to the question that I didn't let you ask, because I think I know where you were heading, is what should the policy be around this? Um, they have to discover or purchase a vulnerability. Um, do they exploit it or report it? 
Um, and it's obvious what happens if they report it. It gets fixed, right? And then they can't use it again. Well, the answer is they should do both. Or at least we think the answer is that they should both report and exploit. The reason you can report and exploit is it usually takes a while for a device to be patched. Uh, I don't know how many of you caught the article in today's Times, I assume it was reproduced other places, um, about Yahoo not putting an emphasis on security the last half dozen years, which is appalling for a company uh, that, is, that has that much personal data from people. Um, but Yahoo is far from the exception in that. Um, time to patch is slow, and then, for example, if you're certain, using uh, Apple pushes its updates, but lots of companies are not in a position to push their updates or don't push their updates. So the point is that law enforcement can sometimes use, can report and use the exploit for a while. They can certainly use the exploit immediately because it's very unlikely that the exploit will be patched immediately. So does the government have a vulnerabilities ethics process? And is this where you were heading? Uh, kind of. Good. Uh, so I don't know where the mic is, but uh, my question was the, um my question was around uh, something that you had talked about earlier where, um, you know, the safety aspect of it, right, that we're putting this wiretap application on your phone, we're putting, essentially putting a backdoor on your, on your, on your phone or whatever, um, that, you know, what if that in and of itself has vulnerabilities, you know? I mean, there was a story recently about Capcom was trying to put in some DRM for a Street Fighter, I can't remember the number, um, and like they put it in and it's like, oh, this thing is trivially exploitable. Like everybody can use this back door. So that's what I meant about in terms of- So I'll, I'll give you the cynical sense. answer first. <laughs> and the cynical answer is, by the time somebody is the subject of a Title III wiretap, I'm going to lose some of my civil liberties friends, but I'm going to say they're pretty bad guys to begin with, okay? okay? Um, I'd really worry much more about the vulnerability getting out and being used, being exposed to other people. And that's, that's where I think more of the, the risk goes okay. than, than on, on what you're saying. And it's, I'm not say, you, you have a legitimate issue, and it goes partially to what should FBI engineering be like and so on and so forth, which is I'd like to talk about for a few minutes at the end. Okay, yeah. Question on the vulnerabilities that you were talking about. So the numbers you were showing and everything were all vulnerabilities that just happen in day-to-day -day development, right? Um, these were vulnerabilities any... that were sold yeah, okay. on the market. Yeah. yeah, so is there anything protecting or pushing, let's say one of these criminals has, they, they have Microsoft Windows 10. They go to Microsoft and say, we want you to push an update with a, vulner a vulnerability in it. Oh, uh, uh, you mean the US government going yes. to? Yeah, 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 let me go to that. Okay. Um, I'll get there. Um, Government developed a vulnerabilities equities process in 2010. It was made public post Heartbleed. Um, there's active interagency review and there's a bias towards disclosure. When I say it was established in 2010, there's been one for a lot, much longer time at NSA. I was, when we were writing our paper, which was in 2013, I talked to some NSA people and the people were describing to me processes from much earlier because of course NSA has been listening for a long time. One of the things we talked about in, in our paper was that if they found a vulnerability and it was in systems that were used in the US and largely by small friendly countries, then they reported it. That was a policy decision. And this was long before the interagency uh, process and so on. Um, so <coughs> Michael Daniel, who is the cybersecurity czar, had a blog post about this vulnerabilities process. And he said, look, if we build up a large stockpile of undisclosed vulnerabilities while leaving the internet vulnerable, Americans unprotected, that's not in our national security interest. So I'm here to talk about lawful hacking. It is inseparable from the whole cybersecurity set of issues. Um, this is the process. There's a whole, a, a little bit more about it, but it's all sort of the things you might expect, but they are not quantified. And you don't have cases. One understands why the US intelligence agencies would not reveal cases, would leave it a little bit vague, would leave themselves room. Um, it is good that there's a process, but I'll tell you now my criticisms of the process. <laughs> and one of them is the shadow brokers story. Now you guys all know shadow brokers? Okay, yes, no, do I need to? This was the, uh, the set of vulnerabilities that got posted a month or two, two months ago now, I think, um, that had 
exploits that had come from the NSA and were being published by a Russian. Um, and how did they get it? Did they break into a, an NSA server? No, it looks like that um, it was left on NSA like other countries that do, uh, other intelligence agencies that do this sort of work, had placed this on a server outside of NSA and then used that to do exploits against particular targets. Usually they clean up the server. This particular server they hadn't cleaned up quickly enough. The exploits got found. The part of the story I want to point out is that they knew the exploits had been found. One of the things they do is they track how their exploits are used by other countries. They did not report to the companies who could patch that they should patch. This only happened after this story became public. I think that's a real lapse by the US government um, because it put people at risk. That is, they knew, the US government knew that other countries were exploiting certain vulnerabilities, and yet they didn't inform the, the manufacturers about patching. Then there's the Apple story. And everybody knows about the San Bernardino phone? Good. And you presumably all know that the FBI purchased a vulnerability and got into the phone, except I, that's not exactly right. What the FBI did was got into the phone by paying um, high six figures. It was reported it was over a million dollars, and then it was reported for anybody who's paying more attention that it was not quite that high. It was high six figures for opening the phone. They didn't actually get the vulnerability. And that meant they didn't give it to Apple. Now, there are all sorts of interesting policy issues they hear. Um, one of them is that they didn't pay for the vulnerability, so they only paid for the phone being opened up, which mean they, means they didn't own the vulnerability. If the government is going, one of the things that, that Blaise, Belevin, uh, Clark, and I believe is that if the government is going to use vulnerabilities and pay for them, they should pay for exclusive use. And with the exclusive use, they then, of course, have the right to report it. But they didn't do it in the Apple case, and therefore they didn't give it to Apple. But I would say that there's a little bit more to that story, which is it is awkward public policy for a company, like, and Apple was in this situation in March, it's not in this situation now, for a company to say, we're not going to pay for vulnerabilities, and then get them from the US government for free. Apple has now said we will start paying for vulnerabilities. Now, there is a question of how you actually do all of this part, because suppose the FBI pays a high six figures, and they give it to Apple, and Apple is only doing a bounty, and I'm now doing what lawyers call a hypothetical. Let's say Apple is only paying $100,000, and it chose not to pay a high six figures. This is completely a hypothetical. This is not a real case. Um, is it reasonable for the US government to pay, behave in this way? We don't have that process worked out. We haven't thought about it enough. We, society, not, not uh, Belvin Blaze and me. Um, is it legitimate? Well, by reporting, US government is increasing security and only exploiting when there's a, an, a wiretap order. But we've seen some examples where that's not true. And this, this part certainly worries the civil liberties community. I'm comfortable with it. Uh, but it does worry, and I get along very well with the civil liberties community. Sometimes I'm there and sometimes I'm not. Um, <coughs> uh, could it be increasing the vulnerabilities market? That is, if law enforcement is buying vulnerabilities, will that increase the number of people who are producing them? Perhaps at the margins, but the big payers are the national security agencies, not law enforcement. Okay. Law enforcement is never going to pay the kind of money that, that national security does. Law enforcement is going to get little less interesting things. And so it's not really going to change the market substantively. Now, it would, uh, this appears to be the case. It would be great to see some economic studies. The problem with the economic studies, everything in this is very quiet, is very black market. It's very hard to find out the real stuff. We did some of that three years ago. It's gotten more difficult since. Um, to prevent dirty play, you enforce reporting of vulnerabilities. You ensure that only the targeted material is accessed and not other material. That is, when law enforcement is reporting to the court, they have to describe how exactly they went in, what exactly they did, showing logs and so on. And there has to be a technical expert. We don't have that in the paper, but it's true. There has to be a technical expert who can say that this is really what happened. Um, we are proposing precisely targeted vulnerabilities. 
um, do this instead of building vulnerabilities into communications infrastructure. Let me tell you what remains to be done, lots. There's no law enforcement equities process. That is to say, the equities process that Daniel described applied to the intelligence agencies. It didn't apply to law enforcement. Apple, uh, FBI took a very public case, the Apple case, and said, oh, we opened the phone. Oh, no, we, didn't ha we don't have the vulnerability. We can't tell Apple. Um, how exactly national security is vulnerabilities equity process works and how it achieves the appropriate balance. There was a study on crypto 20 years ago on whether or not the US should loosen its export controls. That study said you can discuss the policy in an unclassified setting even though you can't discuss individual cases in an unclassified setting. That is, many of the individual cases you need clearance. In the same way, we can have more of a discussion about this even though certain pieces still have to remain classified. And then finally, we need more transparency into the process. Um, and then my final two points, which I've sort of said several times now, is better to use the vulnerabilities there than introduce new ones, and law enforcement will only be exploiting those that are present. And I think that's it, yes. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about House Judiciary, and it's really because of hearings that happened, oops, I don't want to do that, so let me do this. Um, um, it's from hearings that happened in the last day or two, um, which is that um, the FBI director during the Apple case was saying Apple should open the phone. Apple should open the phone. The way they should open the phone is by update, sending an update to the phone which will remove the security protections and thus enable us to try many different pins against the phone till we, till we can open it. Uh, there was more than that, but that's essentially it. Apple didn't want to write the software, which would take between, I think, four and six en kernel engineers two to four weeks. That doesn't sound like that much until you think about those particular people are very specialized and it's an opportunity cost to put them there. That's from the engineering side. From the policy side and the legal side, you're opening up a very unpleasant idea that, that the, a company should be required to do that amount of aid in, a government, in an investigation. But Comey kept saying, the FBI director kept saying, we can't do it. Well, we now know there are two different ways he could have done it. Whatever way the company that opened it up for him did it, and then there is a, I believe, postdoc, certainly research scientist at the University of Cambridge who mirrored the chip and for equipment that cost about $100 was able to find, it, uh, find a four-bit pin in 40 hours. Um, Six-bit would, would take 100 times as long, but of course, first try, one can do better than that as, a, you know, attack can only get better. Um, what's the point of that? The point of that is uh, so then there was a hearing today, or yesterday, in which Comey said, well, we're improving our processes, our efforts. The FBI at present only has a very small group of people. The budget is, I think, $31 million to do these type of investigations. I don't mean computer forensic investigations. I mean breaking into systems, de-anonymizing, uh, decrypting when the key is not obvious and so on. $31 million and I want to say in the range of 30 people, is not an adequate size for the kind of problem that we're facing. And so what I'm saying here is we're going to move to encrypted communications. We're going to move to secure phones. I think that's the only secure thing to do. If, you're going to, if society is moving in that direction, in order for the FBI to be able to do it, it has to change how it does the investigations. And that means a change in scale. So that's all of this in the context of of what's happening now. And I'll stop now and take more questions. Thanks. So th this is just- Hang on a second. Did I get your question? Yes. Good. So I guess it's just a personal uh, opinion question for you seeing the ecosystem. If, it seems to me that the easier thing to do is to create a vulnerability than to have to discover one. And it, it seems that it's, there's an impetus there to create something that, that makes people want to have it on their phones. Wouldn't the, the money from just a logical perspective for law enforcement be better spent on 
funding technology startups with vulnerabilities baked in and sort of creating the market. So if you do that sort of thing, then there are a lot of good guys who have that vulnerability on their device. And you can't ever make the assumption that you're the only one who knows about the vulnerability. In particular, um, the NSA suggested, convinced NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to make dual ECDRBG, which is a pseudo-random number bit generator. Everybody know this story or not? Half not, yes, half no. So um, in order to do a crypto algorithm, uh, in order to run a crypto algorithm, you need an input of random bits to create the key. Um, coming up with random bits is hard. I mean, you don't, you don't get a little elf tossing coins fast enough. What you do is you take a small random string and you stretch it out. Um, using pseudo-random bit generators to make it a long string that looks random for all practical purposes. That is, no polynomial time system can tell the difference between it and random. Uh, NSA convinced NIST to recommend an algorithm for which they had a back door. This was part of the recommended set from RSA BeSafe. RSA um, had been paid, this is RSA, the company that long ago had left Rivest Shamir and Edelman, let me not, um, uh, convinced RSA to put it in as a recommend, as the default algorithm. It got corrupted um, uh, for, VPN, for uh, Juniper's VPN, and somebody else substituted in two different integers, particular curve. We assume who did it, knew backdoor stuff about those particular integers that made it easy to crack. If, and then all sorts of people were eavesdropped upon when they thought they were doing a VPN. That's a particular example of if you're going to make something that you know is vulnerable, well, that's fine if you leave it only to the bad guys to get to. But if you're putting it up on the net, there are too many good guys who are going to get there, and then their devices are vulnerable. So that would be a very dangerous thing to do, even though it would be cheaper. Um, <clears throat> back to the, uh, the topic of these curated apps that are, in, that are installed. Um, after uh, like sending the user to a, like through a man in the middle attack or whatever. Are those sorts of apps things that can be detected like through a phone's activity monitor or are they like, do you have like a Volkswagen situation where it's like it tricks the phone into not even showing any sort of activity about that app? You know, it depends how carefully you're monitoring your phone. Um, I, I am, uh, you know, I'm a geek but I'm not, I'm not somebody who plays with my device all the time. I could easily be monitored, and I suspect most of you in here, the people who do sysadmin stuff and security design for Duo, just like the security group, group at Google, are going to be the people who are more careful. But you, all you have to do, if, think about encrypted VoIP for a moment. You don't have to, to wiretap the phone. At, you don't have to take the, the, the communication off the phone. You just have to leak the encryption key, which is relatively short, certainly small in contrast with the amount that's coming over. If you leak the key, then you wiretap somewhere else where it's invisible. You know, you just do a passive wiretap, you don't do anything active. So the answer is, depends how much the adversary is, uh, you, please, go ahead. And to your point there, um, you should be aware, all of you that are running IP on your phones, that IP is delivered through a, a protocol called GTP-U. This is the tunnel protocol that the IP provides. Most cellular providers and major cell providers in the U.S. are now up to maybe 10 or 20 termination points in the U.S. So all of your IP traffic is going to some central point where it's going. So you and I are talking together over IP in this room from the same provider. It's going to some place and back again. It's not, there are some cut through capabilities. Also, if you're on Comcast, and you want your neighbor to go IP your neighbor. That's PVPoE. That's not going directly, that's going back to some Comcast point, connection point, and then back. This means that, as, as Susan just said, leak the key because the, con the contact points are well known. Now, 5GPP is, pro is probably going to change this. We have to have 5GPP, and I have two proposals in on this, of changing how, uh, but they said we can't touch GTP because that's the whole billing system. But we have to change GTP. That's a whole other story. But th there's, there is this basic model that where do I, IP for cellular, IP for cable and shared networks has to 
for a number of reasons, go through a common point. So leak the key through a simple app, and then you do your wiretap in a known wire, um, warranted method, and you don't turn it over to the bad guys so much. Other questions? Maybe I'll let you do the question this time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, there was a story, I want to say this was earlier this year, this might have been like in February, um, the story leaked about uh, the FBI had um, funded research or allegedly funded research from CMU uh, in the breaking of Tor that they were going after, um, they were going after criminals who run the Tor network. And a lot of the research that had been done, um, there were a lot of people who felt that like it was very overreaching because essentially they hadn't just, you know, broken Tor for these people, but they had broken Tor for a large Nobody, but almost everybody was using it. And so I guess what I wanted to ask is, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you think that they were overreaching? Do you think that, no, it was the right so thing? So I haven't read enough of the court case okay. to, to, you know, I, I, I want to be careful because I haven't, I mean, abstractly, yes, but I haven't read the court case enough to look, uh, or the whole literature about it to look at it. Um, and it goes back to this whole issue of the question that, that you asked, who are you making vulnerable in the process? And, and, and exactly how does the vulnerability work. So in that one, uh, so that, that's all I'll say right there. Okay. I think this is great, by the way. I think this is, for anybody who's listening on streaming video, Duo has this um, foam cube around a mic, and you can just toss the mic. It's very cool. Catchbox.com <laughs> slash refer equals Duo. I don't know. <laughs> Not really. So uh, what do you think that uh, us as a tech-minded group should be looking for from the policy and cybersecurity field? Are there things that we should be looking out for? Are there things that we should be paying attention to? So uh, looking out for is maybe the wrong way, uh, not the way I would put it. Um, I have been thinking about this stuff in some sense since uh, the early 80s and working actively in it since the mid-90s. Um, often the argument is phrased as security versus privacy. Um, and I don't think it really is security versus privacy. Um, it really is about security versus security and whether we secure all of us um, and make law enforcement investigations more expensive, and I talked about raising the budget for the FBI, or whether we make it easier to break into systems um, and then make the investigations cheaper, but then there are a lot of nation states who are very interested. Um, and I think what we bring to the table is the ability to talk about why it's hard to secure a system, where all the vulnerabilities lie. I was uh, at this meeting that you mentioned yesterday, and somebody who was not a security geek spoke, and he talked about, well, does everybody need top-notch security, or could we just do it you know, for, and he didn't say, but I could say it, you know, members of the U.S. government and the defense industrial base and the power grid and, but there are so many insidious sideways that you can get into a system um, that, that I don't think an argument like that makes any sense at all. I, what we bring to the table is the ability to, to, to explain why the problem is hard and why the security problem is hard and why we need to bring everything to bear on it and to talk about it as a security versus security problem. That's, that's what I would say. Sure. So um, Ted from AP was kind enough to like transcribe the conversation today with Comey. Um, and one of the quotes, the, um, I guess, whatever ISSA stands for. The... Uh, ISA, uh, Daryl Issa, he's a congressman from Southern California. Okay. Uh, they said, um, you know, they're talking the context of like the, the capabilities of the FBI and they said, yeah, I mean, in other words, what are the assurances that you're going to get more robust uh, in terms of, you know, uh, decryption capabilities? Do you think that this kind of policy of, of using existing software vulnerabilities is robust enough to actually be, to actually satisfy the needs of law enforcement? That's a very good question. So uh, now I get to do a plug for a book that I'm planning to have out next year on, 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 on this issue. Um, um, the, we're, I think it's a good question, but it may not be the right question. 
And the reason I say it may not be the right question is we're always doing trade-offs in public policy. Facts are only 10% of the equation. So one of the things we've done over the last, I want to say 50 years, but maybe 20 years is, depending on how you slice it, one of the things we've done as a society is we've become immensely more productive by moving things, making things digital. Um, and you know, each of you is going to have your favorite application of something that gets done more quickly in the process of writing this book. I talk a little bit about the Industrial Revolution. I talk a little bit about the changes we did in the 1950s with number crunching. We couldn't have gotten a man to the moon because the calculations, this is in the 70, 60s, the calculations of getting a satellite to rendezvous with the ship had to be and, and this, you know, the moon lander to get back onto the, the spaceship that, that came, the, to the Apollo. Um, if you talk about weather prediction, if you talk about how Amazon does its work, Amazon has to because that's what it relies on to keep its prices cheap. Um, but we're now going to IoT. So all of those things, we've done a trade-off. Uh, we've made things cheaper, but we didn't put in the proper security. And for five or 10 years from the mid-90s to the mid 2000s we got a maybe the the mid 90s to, to 2000 we got away with it from 2000 to 2006 2007 we were seeing a certain amount of theft now what we're seeing is something very different if you think about the dnc hack um the dnc hack is really weird because the russian government is willing to create all sorts of tension in our election and let it be known that it's the russian government doing it this is a pretty weird point thing to happen in a political space. Five years ago, the Russians and the Chinese had capabilities to do cybersecurity harm. But they had very little interest in doing it because the Chinese had lots of, of US bonds. They didn't want to see the US economy go downhill. And the Russians weren't in that kind of fight with us. Now they're using it as a, as a technique against us. And so that's what it has to be weighed against. Will we make certain investigations harder? Yes. Uh, I had a conversation, well, I'll, I'll leave that particular. I, 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 I had a discussion with someone from DOJ about a particular case, and he said the wiretapping was essential in, in getting a conviction. I read through the entire court transcript. Court transcripts are only so useful, they don't capture the emotion, or capture the jury, and so you don't really know what happened. And I said, I think with the transcript, what the wiretapping gave you was the fact that this particular criminal activity was premeditated, but that the criminal activity happened was already clear from every, oh, all the other evidence. He was somebody who was arguing for the ability to continue to tap, so he disagreed, or maybe he was right, I don't know which, but, but I think we're talking about a trade-off in two different spheres. And so you can't, act, the, the answer to your question is, well, actually you have to look over here too. Uh, I've only been at this for 20 years. Steve and Matt, for my uh, people, brought me into this. I was just data communications prior to that. Uh, but the point I think that, you, that you're making, and the point which I, I think we all need to, to think about here, is that we need to increase security in our communications, in our operating systems, all the way up, because we can't get rid of vulnerabilities. There's too much code, there's too many other things. But the more we can convince policymakers that there's always a door, there's always something that somebody left, and that if you increase, give the FBI the funding or, and the others, they'll be able to do their job, whereas, as the NSA said back in 99 when they changed direction, that the risk to um, commerce in not raising security for commerce was too great to the U.S. economy. And that's why they changed back at, was the RSA at, at, in 99, when they came out and, and, uh, and made that announcement of, of letting 128-bit crypto go um, was because of that risk. So what we need to do in our policy discussions here in, the, in Michigan with, with our representatives and the rest of it is to push good, strong security in everything we can do because, unfortunately, we got too much code and we got too much sloppiness and people are too fast to cut the stuff and they put SQL um, injection attacks all over the place and so they have their they have So are you guys Conyers district? Because he, he sees this. I, I mean, he, he seems to understand this. John Conyers is, 
He is Michigan, isn't he? Yes. But not here. He's not here. Okay. Debbie you know, from the Debbie East Coast, Stabenow. Michigan is one. <laughs> Debbie Stabenow. Okay, okay. Yes, I mean, there is this process of education. And I mean, there are groups that are doing that in DC. There's also educating judges and, and, and other legislators as well, because it, it uh, for the inclusion debate, it's at the national level, and there is a National Academy study that has just been started that'll be out next year on uh, what alternatives there are for law enforcement to access to plain text. I, I'm going to be on it, which is part of why I know it. Uh, you need the, the duo cube. I guess, again, on the uh, education piece, I'm just curious on why um, your proposal hasn't picked up more traction in Congress. Um, because it's not actually a proposal for Congress. It's an alternative for law enforcement, and it's an argument, law, it, it, it's a policy argument that says, here's law enforcement says this is the only way to handle the problem. Well, hey, there's this other thing that they have to do at least part of the time. Um, what, what's going on, and you can hear it in, in the hearing that, that John just mentioned, and in fact, six months ago, during my testimony, I said, uh, in the middle of the Apple case, I said, look, um, if it doesn't, if Apple doesn't update, it's not the case that there's a single thing to Apple and it gets, that's it. Um, Vance, who was the Manhattan DA, said he had 200 phones. Um, I have this image that every time Apple does an update, and I know this is, this is a silly image, but I have this image of Tim Cook and a few other senior people going around and doing some Zen chants and, and blessing the update, which works fine when you do an update occasionally. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you have 200 phones from the Manhattan DA, and there are a lot more DAs than the Manhattan DA, and you have 11 phones from the FBI. Then what you do is you get a web form that says, you know, this is the form, I'm the DA, and so on and so forth. And, and you do an update on each phone. It's, of course, particularized to the phone. But as you make that process, it's easy to corrupt that process in many different ways. If I had more time, I'd go through all the different ways. But so I said, it's not secure. What you need to do is, in fact, change FBI's investigative capability and, uh, and really increase it. And um, a month later, there was a Homeland Security hearing uh, no, House and Energy, a uh, House Energy and Commerce hearing that Matt Blaze spoke at, and already there were some questions to the FBI about increasing their capability. And Issa, who had been one of the most severe questioners during the House Judiciary hearing in March, clearly has picked up on this idea. I don't want to say I'm the only one. I may have been the first one to bring it up in a House hearing, but, but this idea is getting traction. Now, what hadn't been going on was, oddly enough, a strong argument within the FBI for that. They were trying a different route. They were trying the, the route of making it damping down on the technology rather than increasing their capability. And so it's a little bit funny to, for me to say, <laughs> they're not doing it right, give them more money. But that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they're not doing it right, give them more money. So I think it was a, a couple of months ago, there was some commentary around, you know, can, can we do the Manhattan Project for encryption? I don't remember where that came from, but if we can build the atomic bomb, why can't we build secure back doors? Right, so, so uh, Matt has a great line on that. He said, this is not about landing a man on the moon. This is about landing a man on the sun. <laughs> and I think that's right. So, so my question would be, one, if you kind of take off your policy hat and put on your mathematics hat, why couldn't we do that? Okay, so and, now I and, have a reading assignment for the rest of you. And, and two, you know, where's wait, the... Wait, 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 give me okay. one question sure. and then I'll yeah. for the other. I can only remember a couple of things at once at this hour. I had to get up early in California to get out here. Um, so um, about a year and a half ago, a group of us, there'd been a group back in the 1990s who wrote a paper on the difficulties of key escrow and the security risks of key escrow. It included Matt Blaze, Steve Bellavin, Whit Diffie, um, there are 11 of them or 13 of them. Um, the group got a little bit bigger and I joined it and we wrote a paper called Keys Under Doormats, um, mandating insecurities, blah, blah, blah. If you go to my web page or you do Keys Under Doormats with any of, excuse me, of those people, you'll come up with it. We, had, we were fighting the following complex problem. The FBI director was saying, 
We want exceptional access. Exceptional access means you can encrypt end to end, but when we have a warrant, a wiretap warrant, we want exceptional access to that communication. We don't know how it can be done, but Silicon Valley is full of really smart people. And so you guys do it. So now all of us really, we weren't all of Silicon Valley, there were 15 of us. But how do you find an engineering proposal that has no specifics? You can't say there's a security flaw here, there's a security flaw there, because there's no specifics. The only thing that you get is a compliment, you know, you guys are really smart. So, so what we did is we pointed out some things. One of the things was that um, over the last 40 or 50 years, we've learned that the more protocols you have, the more likely it is that there's going to be a vulnerability, an implementation error, and so on and so forth. So the simpler you can make things, the better in terms of security. One of the things that, that, that we've done over the last 20 years is introduce authenticated encryption. One protocol that authenticates and encrypts in the same step. That's a win. But if you have exceptional access, you can't have authenticated encryption because authentication is fine for the FBI. The FBI has no trouble with authentication, but it doesn't want the encryption. So you have to separate those two functions. You've made security less good. The next, um, the next thing is that um, forward secrecy. You can't do forward secrecy if you want exceptional access. Well, forward secrecy is a pretty valuable tool. So we pointed that out. We also pointed out the incredible complexity of you take your phone to you name the country, which wants exceptional access. Does the phone have except, does the, the in communication protocol have exceptional access built in for each one of the countries that you take the phone to? We all know that complexity is the enemy of security. So that's the paper we wrote, um, and that's the argument we made. Um, and I have to say the, the paper keeps getting cited in congressional hearings, which pleases us immensely. And it won an EFF Pioneer Award a week ago, which is why I flew to California in the first place. Uh, you had a second half to your question. I, I guess part two was, you know, it, it, it's along those lines of like, you know, what kind of, what kind of education does, do the lawmakers or policymakers need? Because, you know, they say, they, they think, hey, we throw money at the problem, we have a ton of smart people, but there's this like gap of understanding, I think, right. between policy and, and the technical side. And how do you how do we bridge that gap besides having people like you? Um, so it's actually really hard. And now let me tell you about another play, paper that Matt and Steve and uh, Stephanie Pell and I've written that'll be out this fall called "It's Too Complicated." Um, and this is about I told you. Um, oh, I can actually do this because it's right here. I, um, I told you about the difference between law for content and metadata, or, or actually dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information. When, when law enforcement tried to apply that distinction to IP communications, it breaks down. It breaks down in lots of ways. Let me give you a few different examples. One of the things that breaks down is the third party rule. I told you about the fact that when you share information with a third party, um, so when I drive in northeastern Vermont, it's called the Northeast Kingdom, it's sparsely populated. I was <coughs> using Google Maps, and it was telling me turn right, turn left, it was all fine. Driving back south, I wasn't going back exactly where I was, I'd started from, and so I tried to download Google Maps, and I couldn't get it because there were no cell towers. And I said, oh yes, the reason I, Google was telling me what to do, it wasn't Google. I mean, it was the Google voice, but it was the GPS signal that I was getting on the phone as I drove north. So I could think about that, I've told you all of this, all of you in this room understood exactly what I just said, understood that in the first case I wasn't having a communication with Google because there were no cell towers, in the second case I couldn't have any communication with Google, and sometimes I have lots of communication with Google when I'm you know, on a road in Detroit or in, in Chicago or somewhere and it tells me that I, they're going to reroute me because there's a traffic accident, and so they're getting, giving me and, and taking from me real-time information. And if I had a old Garmin in my car, I'd have no communication with the outside world because that doesn't get updated, doesn't tell me where the restaurants have closed and so on, but it also means there's no third party communication. Everything I've said to you makes perfect sense to you, your engineers, your techies, your computer scientists. I didn't have to tell you all the stuff about what's going back and forth with third parties. If I were doing an explanation like that to a judge or to a congressman, it would take 15 to 20 minutes. We also talked about the content, non-content divide. Some of you may know a paper by Fabian Rose, Charles Wright, and others that talks about encrypted VoIP. 
If you look at packet length on encrypted VoIP, packet length, it can tell you what language, whether the speaker is male or female, and sometimes the words they're saying. That's because voice, has, uh, com voice communication has lots of redundancy. Encrypted VoIP, in order to get the stuff across, gets rid of the redundancy, a lot of the redundancy. It does compression. And in the compression, it becomes easy to recognize things. Now, is packet length content? Not until you figure out that you can actually find content out from packet length. We have a whole bunch of examples. We talk about email headers and so on. Headers. IP address is the equivalent of, of a telephone number. The to susan.landau at privacyinc.org is like the addressing envelope inside a package. So somebody sends me a package and it says to Susan on her birthday and there's another one that says to Susan on, you know, uh, because you've graduated college, I don't know what, uh, uh, <laughs> for your new book, whatever it is. Um, those cards inside are part of the content of the package. That's a court ruling from 1879. The to and the from on your email addressing, that's content in the same way. The 2005 Electronic Surveillance Manual has it wrong. So what are we doing? We wrote the paper. We did this long analysis. We wrote the paper. There are people like Joel Reidenberg at, N at Fordham who run sessions for judges um, in which they have a lawyer and a techie talking together and explaining the issues. Does it scale real well? Um, and part of the problem is we've moved to a much more complicated model. So for example, Bellevin is working uh, two days a week at the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board as a technologist looking at some of the things that, that, they're, uh, that the NSA is collecting, uh, how the NSA is doing its collection and whether it fits the law in terms of thinking about it technologically. But I think we, we uh, Hewlett Foundation, I'm giving you a very long-winded answer. Hewlett Foundation has funded 15 million at MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley, and then Kennedy School at Harvard, which is a policy school, got a private foundation, a private grant of 15 million from somewhere else to develop cybersecurity policy training. And so that's a little bit different from the legal stuff. There is some legal training. And I know somebody at Wayne State who does some of this. I know somebody at, at uh, University of Michigan Law School who thinks about DRM and copyright issues, but thinks about it technically as well as legally. We need these crossover, this kind of crossover training. Uh, it's, it's complicated. It's too complicated is the answer. Have I given you too much to think about? Hi, I'm Doug Song. Uh, so back in 1999, and it, it sounds like to me that you have a perspective that uh, really end-to-end, -end, an end-to-end -end argument in terms of uh, surveillance that you know, actually, rather than doing it with middle boxes in the middle of the network anymore, we should be really targeting these sort of the ends, uh, uh, basically f supported by an ecosystem, maybe a market, right, of, of private right. the suppliers of, of exploits. And, and some of this exists today, right, like in the black market, you know, you can rent time and exploit kits and so forth. You know, in 1999, I built a bunch of surveillance tools, uh, the sniff that you know did all this stuff. You know, email, instant message, mail, all this kind of stuff. Didn't commercialize it. Built a company instead, Arbor Networks, that ended up selling to you know primarily to all the carriers. Uh, wherein you know we had the opportunity potentially to build those kind of tools, and we didn't. Uh, Neris, another company that was uh, caught in the ATD data center in right. San Francisco, was uh, did that instead. But. There were other folks that built tools like that, like this. Uh, so post sniff there was a tool called EdCap, written by this guy, these guys, Alor and Naga, who went on to build a company called Hacking Team, which did end up selling uh, their their tools to actually a whole lot of law enforcement in pl in other places in the world that are in places where that do not ex respect human rights in any way. That's right. And so you know you called out the the example of, again the FBI renting. Uh, you know, access, uh, you know, to, to, to an exploit uh, capability from an unknown actor who, uh, you know, granted that, that one time, but it would be better if those, those, if those vulnerabilities were actually within our control to be able to, uh, does that mean then, does it imply that if we were to actually support more of this domestically, that that would be regulated in such a way as we did with the BXA export controls back in the 90s? I don't think, I don't think export controls are going to work. I would love to see them work. But I don't think they're going to work because I think it's too easy to have a black market. You can, the thing about regulating selling of equipment, and it began to break down for a lot of reasons in the 90s. One of the reasons was open source. But when you were selling equipment, they were physical boxes. 
Um, if you think about the whole Apple issue, the government has a better, and I'm not saying anything that the government doesn't know and that Apple doesn't know. Um, the government has an easier way to regulate Apple because you can regulate physical devices and Apple does the whole ecosystem. Um, what you're talking about is regulating, con you're controlling small pieces of code. It's, it's not gonna work. You'll, the economy is already underground. It'll go even deeper underground. It won't disappear. I mean, I, I wish there were a solution like that. I just don't see it. I just wonder if, if, equity, if this equity equation gets more complicated than when the same capabilities are, are available to multiple actors. They are already. Okay. My other follow-up follow question is then related to the, the, the point about Russia. Uh, why, why it's, I'm just curious why you think it's curious that the Russians have done this, because for a long time, well, in, in the wake of the North Koreans, it could be argued that, you know, that deterrence, actually, and, and, and even, not, even the, not even the North Koreans, but the U.S. Right, issuing these uh, warrants to the, these PLA officers, worked, right, at a different level. It worked. The, so for, uh, everybody know about the five warrants against, uh, three or five, I don't remember. Five. Five. Against PLA officers who were stealing stuff from the U.S., but they're, of course, in, in Shanghai, stealing stuff from the U.S., and the U.S. has issued warrants against them. The reason I think the agreement between China and the U.S. happened is because it's in China's interest to further control what its people does on the network. And so that's why the Chinese were willing to do that, not because they saw this, uh, it was a byproduct of what they wanted rather than this was what the US was putting on them. Why is Putin doing this? I mean, look at Crimea and look at Ukraine and looking at shooting down the plane and the false information. The Russians have groups of people, the Chinese too, who, who send out tweets that are completely false. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding certainly in Ukraine, about who actually shot down the plane. And in fact, there was just a study that came out by the UN, I think, about the, this is the Malaysian plane that was shot down. And it tracks, very interestingly, I haven't seen the report. I've tried to look at the report, but the report came out yesterday. I don't, so far it's not public, at least. At least it wasn't public while I was at SFO yes, this morning. Um, but, but one of the things that the investigators did was looked at a lot of pictures of the missile that shot down the plane as it traveled from Russia into Ukraine. And this is the kind of data that we didn't used to have, but lots of people take lots of photos and they get uploaded and there's all this metadata and there's, and so on. <coughs> but Putin is doing all sorts of things that go below the level of an act of war. But I don't think we saw them under Khrushchev, under, certainly not under Gorbachev, but I, in, in, and I, I, I've read a lot of history of that period too. We didn't see that kind of stuff. We saw control on Poland and on Hungary and so on and so forth, but we didn't see these kind of low level attacks against the US, directly against the US in this very public and very noticeable way. It's a very different kind of behavior. So it's a, it's a, a political science analysis of what's going on and he's, he's thumbing his nose. And he's certainly, uh, uh, in terms of the election trying to create FUD, uh, for those of you who don't know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Well, I think one of the, the benefits that, that Putin has is that he has this rogue state inside of his country that gets to do things that don't necessarily hold the entire country accountable. Uh, does that serve as a negative? I don't, think, I don't think it's seen outside Russia as not under his control. Um, I, with the amount of control that Putin has over the country, with the amount of assassinations that Putin has done outside the country, uh, as well as inside the country, I don't think anybody can realistically believe that the criminal activities by the internet actors uh, from inside Russia, the criminal gangs, he may not control them, but he permits them. Well, okay. sure, and it's going to talk about like the, the sort of glancing, uh, permissive, Right. Activities but, that, that's just underneath an act of war. I'm just wondering if that doesn't serve as a negative object lesson of like empowering certain enforcement agencies or state agencies. Ah, but even uh, that. I think of the U.S. and maybe I'm naive. Uh, I think of the U.S. as operating still under a rule of law, uh, and that's where I'm operating from. Um, and I know whether it's Black Lives Matter, which sees things in a different way, and for some people in this country. It is really different. Driving while black, I got stopped for a speeding ticket uh, when I was driving to WPI last spring. And I was speeding. I probably shouldn't say this on this tape. I, <laughs> I was speeding. And the thing I thought about as I got stopped is, 
If I were male and black, I'd have gotten the ticket. I didn't get the ticket. But I was a different color and a different age and a different gender. And I think that's why I didn't get the ticket. Um, so I say rule of law, but I realize it's also differential. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that we see NSA, FBI, CIA operating under a great deal more control than uh, one of the things that's very interesting to read is the church committee hearings from the 1970s, which were an outcome of the um, Watergate uh, burglary. And there were hearings on what, there were very interesting hearings on what NSA, FBI, CIA were doing, not necessarily under Nixon, but over a 40 year period. And one can certainly say FBI was not operating under rule of law. Um, certain actions of CIA. NSA had been downloading, had been getting copies of every telegram into the United States from the mid-1940s until a couple of weeks before they were questioned in 1975. Um, we're not living in that world now. There's still things that happen that the government does that aren't legal, and there are people who, who experience less protection than and I, you know, if I say it a third time, as a white middle-aged woman, probably I'll get stopped as I drive back to the hotel. Um, but, uh, but the point is, we live under much more of a rule of law than the, the Russian. The Russians do not live under a rule of law. Many societies don't live under a rule of law, but the Russians certainly don't. So, one, one last thing before we have to, to wrap. I have a, a device with me, which I think is proof that backdoors can work. And it is the... TSD 3600 device, which had the original Clipper chip in it. Can you say a few words about what a success Clipper was? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but first I have to tell the story I told yesterday at, at the beginning of my talk at this workshop, and then I will talk about the Clipper chip. So Witt and I had, done, had been on an ACM committee, Association for Computing Machinery, committee on crypto policy in the wake of the Clipper chip. And uh, this was like any committee, you argue about the conclusions. But in this particular committee, we had to argue about every sentence. And there was one period where we spent two hours on two paragraphs. It was grueling. At the end of this experience in 94, Witt suggested that we write a book on crypto policy together. And we write it the way the report should have been, you know, properly done. And he said it would take either three or six months. I don't remember which. Three and a half years later, the book was done. But there was, um, there was this period where I said, well, I don't know. I might be trying to do this, or I might be trying to do that. And then when I said, yes, I want to, Witt said, I might be trying to do this, or I don't know. And then one day, I came home, and there was a FedEx box, and I opened it up. And there was a telephone security device that used triple DES. And I turned to my husband, and I said, I'm writing the book with Witt. <laughs> <laughs> the Clipper chip. Uh, 1993, the US government introduced the idea of the clipper chip. It was 80-bit key, which for that time was pretty good uh, for encrypting digital telephony. Uh, at that point, the US government really didn't think the internet was the place things were going. They thought digital telephony was. It was encrypting digital telephony. And uh, it used an 80-bit key with the key split and shared with two agencies of the federal government. They hadn't yet figured out the agencies. Um, they had convinced AT&T, which was planning to build a telephone security device, not to do it with the crypto they were going to do, but to use, it, to use Clipper instead. Um, and they envisioned that this, now I'm going to tell you something that only the older people will remember, they envisioned that this would be sold in malls at Radio Shack. <laughs> okay. And you're not supposed to say when you're in the federal government a particular company, but Radio Shack was in all the malls, so that's, that's the point. Well, when Witt and I wrote the book, the book came out in 98, so I talked to AT&T in 96 or 97. They had sold 15 to 17,000 telephone security devices, half of them to the US government, to the FBI. 15 to 17,000 devices divided by the number of malls. It doesn't work. <laughs> it was a complete and total market failure. What it did do was to delay the deployment of crypto in the marketplace. Now, why I say that, there were all the fights in, in, <coughs> in the 1990s about escrow. The, the export control changed in 2000. Fact is, until Snowden, we didn't, uh, Google was, I guess, encrypting interdata center communications pre-Snowden. It hadn't done all of them, but it speeded up post-Snowden. None of the other companies were doing even that. So it wasn't just Clipper that delayed, but certainly that the US government push against crypto did have an impact. I'm not sure who, who wrote this. Uh... I'm not sure who wrote this obituary, but it says, "Here lies Clipper, a friend of few, an observer of many. <laughs> Great at keeping secrets, except the three and four-letter agencies, RIP." <laughs> 
So uh, let's all give Susan a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks it. A lot. And I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming to Duo Tech Talks. We'll be here next month or later in October, I guess. So just a few weeks from now, uh, back here in Ann Arbor. Um, and also in London in, I think, a week, if, uh, if you can tune in for that. So um, thanks for coming. And uh, it's a little late, so try to scooch out of here as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you.